everyone. How are you guys doing today? We have the pleasure of um, Rain Grant zooming in from Colorado today, which is pretty cool because technology. Um, we appreciate you being at our 24th annual fungus fair. Um, I hope you had a wonderful day of all things fungi because today's our day. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Rain in 2020 at our fungus fair. And it is just such a blessing to have her as a breath of life into all the things of uh, mycology. So thank you so much for being here today. And everybody's looking forward to your presentation. Wonderful, wonderful. Goodness, I am really honored to be here today. Um, really, really honored to share this information. Um, I have been going down the rabbit hole of studying fungi for about a decade now. Uh, started in, in 2012. And um, as you can see, th this is the name of a documentary I've been working on uh, titled, Can Mushrooms Save the Planet? And I have been going down the rabbit hole of many, many, many topics surrounding uh, how fungi can positively be, well, how can we work with these creatures to help with any many, many, many of the epidemics that our planet is facing. Now that is a discussion that I have put on many, many talks about, but today I am going to be focusing more along the lines of health and well-being in our bodies because fungi play so many roles on our planet, including our health and well-being. So my name is Rain Grant and um, I, uh, I started the Four Corners Mycological Society here. Uh, I'm in Durango, Colorado area but this incorporates all four of those states because we have uh, certain ecological systems here. And um, I just love going out and foraging. And so that's something I'm sure a lot of you can connect with as well. Um, the queendom of fungi. I like to call it the queendom because it is um, very prolific, very creative. And it's, you know, I mean, it's got a balance of masculine and feminine, but, um, but I like to say queendom because it's, not, it's fun. It's fun. But there are just so many things that fungi can do for our, uh, for our well-being, for a sense of, of well-being in our brain and our nervous system and our health, uh, helping to, you know, uh, it's an immunomodulator. There's just so many different things that fungi can do to help us. Now, um, I do also uh, do other presentations and talks and, and uh, classes on medicinal mushrooms, but today we are gonna focus specifically on mushrooms, nootropics, aphrodisiacs, and how we can really connect with our, within ourselves, within our environment, and uh, with each other and with our, um, even our intimate partners. Um, there are many mushrooms that help with the well being. You know, we've got reishi, which is known as the, uh, the mushroom of immortality. And anything that is going to help us with longevity is going to help us in the realms of our functionality in many, many uh, facets. We've got lion's mane. And I'm gonna go into a lot of these different mushrooms more uh, specifically, but right now I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of an overview. We've got lion's mane, which is really well known for, um, for helping our nervous system. Yes, it helps with uh, many other aspects of, uh, of our health, but uh, growing new nervous tissue and also uh, protecting the nervous system is very, very important so that I believe it all starts in the gut and our nervous system. And when we are functioning properly, we're able to better assimilate these stresses as well as uh, when we're cognitively present, we're able to connect with each other. Okay, a lot of people, um, we've been isolating a lot because of the current state of affairs with COVID and things like that. There's been a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. And um, some of these nootropics and, um, and, and mushroom medicinals, they lift our energy, but they also calm our energy. They ground us down and they calm our nervous system. So all of these things are in well balance. And I have been playing around with a lot of these mushrooms. Um, so agents of pleasure, okay? I am a big advocate for finding the joy in life. And that starts with how we look at things and stepping into to our gratitude. It's a state of being and it's a choice. But what are agents of pleasure specifically? And that is any substance, anything that arouses the, the, the senses, helps us to uh, produce feelings of well-being, um, anything that's pleasurable, whether that, uh, 
whether that's just excited to see somebody or eating a piece of chocolate or any number of things. Yeah, yeah, lavender, mm, all these different things are agents of pleasure. And first and foremost in life, we need to be able to enjoy our life. And, um, and I find that, you know, with nu nu proper nutrition and proper uh, just taking care of our bodies, we're able to, to drop into those states a lot easier, but also making the choice to drop into those states also helps to balance our immune system. So it's kind of like it's a give and a take. Um, desire is the fire of love. If it is extinguished, Love smolders and dies. <laughs> I love this. So what is our bliss state? You know, um, think about this, you know, think about what is your bliss state? Because this is going to be different from for person to person. And um, so, yeah, here's a fun picture of mushroom aphrodisiacs. So um, what, <laughs> let's start off with saying, what is an aphrodisiac? Okay. An aphrodisiac is anything which arouses or increases sexual or sensual desire attraction, pleasure, and behavior. It's usually a substance. You know, if you look it up, people will say aphrodisiac is something that you eat or intake, but I take it to the next level. An aphrodisiac can be any, since anything that elicits these, these uh, pleasurable uh, feelings in all of our sensations, okay? Scent, sensation, visual, even a thought can be considered an aphrodisiac. All right, moving on to what is a nootropic, okay? Nootropics are thought to be specifically located in the brain. But upon further researching, reading, and um, going to classes and things like that, nootropics have to do with our entire nervous system, okay? This is like in our gut. This is in our fingertips. This is throughout our entire body. It's all connected. It all works together. And so a nootropic is a natural or synthetic substance which has positive effects on the brain and the central nervous system. Uh, they're usually stimulating. They help with cognitive function, helps with memory. Uh, I have found that it calms, my, calms me. It helps you with stress management, helps you to pay attention to things. Um, and it actually helps with motivation. So people who are uh, athletes, athletic performers, often use nootropics in their, um, in their training because it does, uh, when things are functioning, you feel motivated, you feel on top of things. And so uh, these things help to release our happy chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all of the good stuff. Um, and so I'll get more into that. So um, happiness chemicals, we have some in our brains, but they do start in our gut as well. Like I said, so dopamine, uh, we'll go into these, but these are the four main ones. But um, I focus mainly on um, what, what produces serotonin in our bodies and dopamine, how to get out of those depressed states, get our energy levels up, and then oxytocin, that's the, that's the really big one, you know, and how, how to produce that not only with other people or pets, but within ourselves, we can produce oxytocin by the right, the right uh, thoughts in our brain. So serotonin here, serotonin, I love this. This is produced uh, by uh, psilocybin mushrooms, but also uh, many things in nature. And just like I said, right thought. It's a feel good chemical. It, uh, it's really good for our nervous system, but it's produced in the brain. Um, it helps us with our sleep patterns. It helps us with our mood, helps with sexual function, bone, even bone health. And it's considered a, uh, it's an antidepressant. Um, obviously if you're feeling good, that's the opposite of being depressed. Um, so some of the things you can do to increase serotonin in your life is by exercising, um, taking supplements, getting a massage or massaging someone can help produce these things. Um, different foods that have tryptophans in it. Um, yeah, psilocybe mushrooms are, um, are well known for flooding the brain with serotonin. One of the things I have actually been um, researching and studying and creating products is not only the production of serotonin, but when you are in a state where you are flooding your brain with serotonin, you can often feel depleted uh, afterwards. 
And how can we replenish that naturally so that we can keep those, those bliss states, feel, those good feelings going? We've got dopamine. So this is a, um, <clears throat> this is a chemical that is released when you are expecting reward. Like when you're excited about something, you're like, all right, you know, I'm going to, oh, I get to go to that, that party, that concert, or uh, whatever it is that makes you feel excited. Oh, we're going to get to go out to eat. Oh, uh, the dinner tonight is going to be great. You know, whatever that is that you're, and it's like anticipation and excitement. Like I was kind of feeling antsy to do this presentation. So um, I was starting to get really uplifted and I, I know my dopamine levels were going up. Um, but dopamine is created in the gut. Um, we need healthy gut flora in order to have a healthy immune system, a healthy nervous system, and healthy mood. It all, you know, if we're not eating well, if we're not taking care of our microbiome inside of our guts, we're really, <clears throat> we're really, um, we're probably going to not feel so good. We're probably going to feel low level of energy and all of that. <clears throat> And my favorite is oxytocin. I love, I love oxytocin. It is such a good feeling. Give that long hug to someone after about 12, 15 seconds. You start, I, I start feeling a rush of this just, mm, it just feels so good. And we need more touch. We need more touch in our lives. But some of us don't necessarily even have that as an option, especially if we're isolating, we're in fear mode, our oxytocin levels are gonna be very, very low. <clears throat> but it is the love hormone and um, it is connected to the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland has to do with our reproductive system and our longevity and our energy levels. All of these things are, are tied in and, you know, neuroscientists and whatnot, oh, I, I'm, I get so turned on by listening to some of the things being said, but they will even admit that we don't understand all of the inner workings of our nervous system and our brain and, um, you know, there's, there's a base we can go back to, and that's feeling okay <laughs> in ourselves. But hugs and cuddles, lovemaking, obviously, massage, like I said, uh, listening to music can elicit oxytocin release, like listening to your favorite tune. Um, telling, telling someone how much you care about them can actually create oxytocin release in your brain. So, you know, being open about how you feel about like, you know, just telling, telling your sister that you love them, you know, telling, even telling your cat that you love them. It's, it's interesting, but it elicits a response in the brain and then it lifts your mood. Um, you'll see, oh yes, doing nice things for people, but also increasing your intake of essential vitamins, such as vitamin D. We all know mushrooms, our, uh, you know, our, our edible mushrooms, like even, even oyster mushrooms and even portobello mushrooms, they all have high levels of vitamin D. So increasing your vitamin C and your magnesium, your essential fatty acids, uh, even eating chocolate, okay? And there are bliss chemicals in chocolate and I can get more into that. I've been playing around with some of the isolated um, bliss chemicals found in chocolate, such as phenylethylamine, phenylalanine and, um, and, and theobromine. These all raise these moods and um, mixing them with particular mushrooms have, has been shown to really help, especially in many of my clients. I've been seeing, getting a lot of really incredible feedback. And some of these things sound very uh, just common sense, right? But, but truly, it's important. Um, I was doing some research. If you're, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, Return to the Brain of Eden, Restoring the Connection Between Neurochemistry and Consciousness. Now, this book goes back to 200,000 years ago when, um, when human beings, our brains were expanding, like they were getting very, they were expanding, and then they started shrinking back right about the time that we uh, started growing grains, uh, specifically like monoculture. And, uh, you know, it's called grain brain, if you will. And uh, yeah, uh, just eating too many grains is really, uh, our brains started shrinking. And, um, you know, there's this whole tie to Parkinson's disease and other uh, neurological diseases and degenerative diseases that, um, that are connected to our gut flora. And, it's, it's pretty important. Um, 
it to function properly our nervous system needs to be healthy and all of us our nervous systems as we age starts to degenerate and what can we do to not only we want to i mean as young as possible we really want to get a hold of that but you know people who are uh experiencing uh you know, mental degrades and things like dementia and any of these other nervous system issues, like I said, like Parkinson's, MS, and, um, and even epilepsy and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of these mushrooms are, have been shown to really, really help. And um, it really touches me when I see it firsthand, when I'm like, because I make tinctures for my company and I make other types of elixirs and things. And just seeing how much it really helps people, it gives me hope because I really hate to see people suffer. And I know myself, I don't want to suffer. Now I have this slide up here, the heart and brain connection. There is a book called The Science of the Heart. And it talks about the heart being a brain, right? I think I get more into it actually. I, um, yeah, I will go more into that. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go in order here with my slides, but um, what is the heart and brain connection? So we have the brain here, we have the brain here and our gut is also a brain. In fact, you could, argue that we're covered in billions of brains because we're just like, you know, we have billions of organisms on us. So it's all like one big universe on our body. But we oftentimes think of the brain or how we think, how we function our brain as just being in our head. And um, a lot of focus is put on that, especially when we start talking about psychedelics and things like that. People think about the brain. I these are like the vagus nerve goes straight to the heart. Our gut really, really affects all of these things. And so I've been kind of putting and piecing together some of these concepts and um, which is interesting because then I'll go back to historical usages of some of these mushrooms specifically. And I'm like, oh, they, they knew about that back then. This isn't new. We're just kind of like remembering a lot of the, the information that's kind of been lost. Um, this is kind of silly. I'm going to show how things in nature look very uh, sexual, sensual. I was uh, in Occidental and uh, found, I don't even know what those mushrooms are, but I just know they are very, very feminine looking. Um, yes, sensuality, sexuality, you know, it's kind of a taboo topic, but at the same time, it's kind of, um, it, it's like sex sells, you know? So it's like, it's taboo in one sense, but then the other sense it's, it's marketed, you know? And um, really where's that balance? You know, our bodies, our, uh, they're, they're created to give and receive pleasure. Even just a touch is, is pretty important. Even if we're just, a, <laughs> this is just funny. I wanna come <laughs> cultivate my own mushrooms, uh, unsubscribe to modern socialization norms and meet our alien ancestors. I just wanted to throw that in there because it's funny. <laughs> so, okay, I'm gonna jump into mushrooms as an aphrodisiac, okay? So the first one that most people probably know about is through scent. Now, truffles have been shown to be uh, an aphrodisiac. Um, the scent specifically, and even when we taste it, but it is specifically the scent. Um, and truffles, most, most of you probably know what a truffle is. It's, it's like a little tuber shaped mushroom that grows under the ground and um, it has a very, very pungent odor that is, um, is prized, is very, you know, is prized all over the planet and um, very delicious. And um, they have found that the, you know, that these, uh, these mushrooms uh, produce pheromones that are very similar to pheromones that pigs release as well as humans. So that's why people use the truffle pigs to go and find them is because they, they smell, <laughs> they smell sex <laughs> and, um, and then they go digging for it. Um, we can utilize these truffles in our meals and um, probably even, uh, I haven't put truffle on me per se, but I have smelled people that smelled like truffles. I was like, gosh, you smell like a truffle. I hmm, wonder why my mouth is salivating. <laughs> but uh, they have found that, um, that these, uh, these chemicals, these odors are also released in certain mammals. And so, for some reason, we're closely related to pigs. It's a very intriguing thing. And that's, that's a topic that's, that's 
completely separate from here. But I find it interesting that it's found in, I, I have smelled a, a partner, a male partner, and his underarms actually smelled like truffles. And apparently it can be detected in, um, in women's urine. So that's just, it's interesting how really connected and similar many organisms really are and how we can work together. Here's somebody digging a truffle up out of the ground. Here's a little bit of information out of uh, the psych uh, it's the uh, encyclopedia of the aphrodisiacs. I was just kind of, they're just kind of talking about how the truffle contained the, this particular pheromone. Very interesting stuff. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, if you want to learn more about aphrodisiacs, I highly suggest this book here, uh, the encyclopedia of Af aphrodisiacs, psychoactive substances for use in sexual practices, but they go into a lot of different plants as well as mushrooms. And they uh, go into the history, the science, and a lot of the, a lot of the things we want to know about, you know, I want to, I want to see the fol folklore. I want to see how it's been used traditionally, but I also like to see the science because, you know, I like to tie that together because then it makes more sense for me. Um, but what, you know, when, when we stimulate our libido, okay, we're actually stimulating our chi or our life force. And this is what causes longevity is to have this energy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it goes back to sex, but it doesn't have to be sex. It can be sensuality. It doesn't, you know, I, I, I know people who are asexual, they don't practice sex, but they are highly sensual. And I think it's really important, especially with the oxytocin release to, to be in your sensuality. And sometimes even just doing things like dancing to your favorite music can, like, like I said, produce those, those um, feelings. All mushrooms are magic. I don't know if you've seen this picture circulating on the internet. I think it's really cute and it's just true. You know, people go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm like making a turkey tail uh, elixir or something. Oh, is that a magic mushroom? I'm like, you know, <laughs> all mushrooms are magic now, you know. Um, <clears throat> mushrooms have been considered the forbidden fruit. Uh, there are whole, uh, there are religions based around mushrooms. There are um, what I would consider a cult. I have talked to mushroom cults that are surrounding specifically Amanita muscaria. Um, and, um, but there, you know, there's a lot of speculation with this. There's some really good books. And I wanted to put a shout out there. If, if any of this information you want to know more about, or if you want to know the sources, the books, the papers, the science papers and things like that, uh, feel free to get a hold of me personally. You can send me an email and I'll send you all of my sources so that you can dive in deeper if you are interested in these topics. So when we are talking about aphrodisiacs and utilizing substances by ourselves or with a partner or even with a group of people, um, it's all about how much, you know, that's dosage amounts, your set and your setting. So the dosage is, uh, it, it, like I said, it's the amount. How much are you taking? How much are you in? Uh, yeah, how, how, what are the, uh, the measurements? Your set is um, what mental state are you in? You know, that really, you know, setting your intention, that's, that's the set. Going into it with the intention of having a good experience, not with going into something with fear um, or uh, anxiety, but coming into it <sighs> taking that breath, being grounded, being present. And then the setting, how do we set up our environment? You know, make it cozy, make sure you're warm, make sure you have your, you know, your grapes and your, you know, your drinks, your beverages, or, you know, whatever that looks like to you. It could be flowers, it could be incense, but setting up an environment where you feel comfortable and where you feel good, you know? These are all really important when you're going into anything, whether, whether or not you are going to intake a psychedelic substance or just, you know, I mean, just drinking a glass of wine, we'll just say, you know, which is actually not really that much of an aphrodisiac. Um, I mean, but anyways, so yes, there are types of dosages, okay? So uh, Native Americans have, uh, have segmented, se segmented into different, uh, different dosages. There's a medicinal dose, okay, uh, which would be like a microdose or a small amount, an aphrodisiac, aphrodisiac dose, which would be kind of a middle of the road, you know, where you're feeling euphoria, 
um, but you're not kind of, you know, you're still, pre you're still able to function. You're still present. You're still able to, to be um, cognitive. And then there's a shamanic dose, which is going to be a large amount of something where you may not necessarily want to be around anyone. You might want to be alone, or you might want to be in a, um, a lead group or, uh, you know, in a, in a safe space, in a safe container space. That's a very feminine looking mushroom. <laughs> and the witch's cap is very feminine as well. <laughs> just throwing these out there. Uh, this is just gatation. So I was. <laughs> I don't know. It tastes like water. <laughs> mm, it's actually, I'm going back for more. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Ah. This is gutation and uh, the water, when there's a lot of it, it will come out of the little poly port, out of the pores. And uh, it's quite lovely. <laughs> uh, sort of. Yes. Okay. So yes, mushrooms. Mushrooms are very sensual in the way they even look, you know, and uh, for those of us who really love mushrooms, um, you know, going out in nature and finding them can elicit so much excitement that I do. I feel like I'm 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 high off of just nature, and I, I do. I kind of I kind of get turned on. I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> so yeah, set setting <laughs> uh, using aphrodisiacs. Yes, delicious aromas, incense, sage, flowers. Uh, you know, bring in your favorite treats. I like to bring in like cherries and raspberries and all the delicious things because you know all of our, when you are stimulating all of your senses it is quite I mean that's the epitome of to me what an aphrodisiac really is we've got five senses all right I'm just going to go into this very quickly we've got vision what looks appealing you know some people I mean we are all so different so think about what that means to you what is visually appealing to you what makes you feel blissful or even turned on by looking at it. And it, and it can be as simple as like some roses or a mushroom, or it can be looking into our partner's eyes. You know, it can, it can be any, anything, you know, sky is the limit, you know, our, our hearing, what, what do we hear? Sounds it could be, it could be um, singing bowls. It could be music. It could be the sound of someone's voice when they're talking, but these things elicit certain feelings in us and they're producing these, these chemicals in our brain. Touch, touch is super powerful. Even if you are touching yourself or touching your cat or touching the hand of your, your daughter, you know, for instance, I was snuggling my baby girl this morning and I was like, oh, I love you so much. And she's like giggling and I'm like, oh, you know, like it's just so good. Smell smell and then our, our taste. I am skipping through some of these. I, I you know, I, 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 extrapolated, uh, extrapolated some of these slides from other, um, presentations. So this is kind of like a mix of, of a few, uh, presentations in one here. Um, and then we forget about our sixth or seventh senses. What about our psychic abilities? What about our connection just through being in a room with someone or being, you know, or, or not even being in a room with them. You know, if you're thinking about each other at the same time, you know, our electromagnetic field around our bodies are pretty, pretty large, even being in the next room with someone or being right next to someone, just those energies alone, you know, and, uh, you know, depending on what your personal beliefs are, you know, some people don't believe in telepathy and some people do, but there, there's a lot to be said for that sense being stimulated and that can go that can be in the realms of meditating with your partner you know using tantra kundalini energy like a stimulated kundalini energy and whatnot all right here okay so i'm going to go into first and foremost cordyceps okay um there's cordyceps sinensis which um you know grows in tibet the and then there's cordyceps militaris but there are many many varieties of uh, of cordyceps, and these are a very strange parasitic uh, fungus. You know, they, they've been found to fight cancer and promote longevity, but this particular mushroom is referred to as the Viagra of mushrooms. And I'll kind of go into that. You know, it does raise our libido specifically in men, but it helps with both men and women. And I thought it was more of a masculine mushroom, but I just recently found that it is um, extremely good for females in balancing hormones. 
um, it grow, it grows on usually the, uh, it's like the, this is the ghost moth, I do believe the Himalayan ghost moth. And so it grows on the, the, uh, the caterpillar. So when it's in its larva state, um, there, I, I don't have a lot of pictures of the militaris, but that does grow on a, um, a butterfly larva. Um, but you get my point. And it doesn't do the same thing to us as it does to them, thankfully. But um, what it does is it, it, it attacks their central nervous system and um, takes over their body and then just kind of consumes them, pops a, pops a mushroom out of the top of its head so it can spread its spores. Um, that's a tarantula there. I got some of these slides from uh, John Holiday of Aloha Medicinals. He shared a, a bunch of really cool pictures. It's creepy, but it's it's cool. <laughs> um, you know, it's been used for thousands of years uh, in Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine to, uh, you know, for, for these purposes. And now science is kind of backing up that data. Um, cordyceps activate dopamine and adrenaline receptors in the brain. So this is kind of exciting, um, but it does, it balances hormones in our body like estrogen and progesterone. And, um, and supporting our adrenal glands, it allows for, um, for longevity when we're, uh, it's, it's really good for athletic performance, whether that is in the bedroom or like if you're training to be a runner or a climber or anything where, you, or even just going to dance, you know, I'm, I'm a dancer. So I, I will take my cordyceps and go just dance. And it gives me sustained energy. And it's not like, I feel like I'm on coffee where I have a crash. It's just like, I feel I feel exuberant and I feel like a lot of vitality. Um, so this is a really, really good uh, mushroom for both men and women because it also raises testosterone in the body. That's how, you know, we have that longevity or that, um, that ability to go for a long time. But this is helpful for men. And it's also been used in ED, like erectile dysfunction and things like that. Um, it, because it does raise the testosterone in the body. But like I said, it also is balancing out the, uh, the estrogen and whatnot. So this is really good for women. Um, cordycepin is, is, the, uh, is a chemical that's found in cordyceps. And that they're showing that it, like, it really helps with depression. It really raises the mood. And so if, if it's uh, activating our dopamine receptors in the brain, then this is, this is like a huge thing. You know, uh, they're actually showing that it, it works almost better than the drug um, imprim see, Impramine. So I'm not, I'm not really familiar with that drug except for what I've read about it because I haven't had to give it to anyone in my family or anything. But, you know, when we're depressed and we're on synthetic drugs, you know, if it helps, it helps. And like, that's really good. But if we can go a more natural route, why not? And, and, and the thing is with cordyceps, it's not going to counteract any of these drugs that you're on. I mean, of course, always, you know, seek advice from your doctor before, you know, taking new, new substances, but, but certainly what the data is showing is that it doesn't interfere with those, uh, with those other drugs. So you can take it in, in addition to, um, but it's also incredibly good for our nervous system, going back to the nervous system. It's super important to keep our nervous system healthy and also protect the mylar sheath or that, that, is all it surrounds the nervous tissue right and so this is um this is really good for protecting our nervous system cordyceps i'm all about it whether it is the cordyceps militaris or the uh, sinensis um cordyceps uh in its wild state is extremely um expensive i went into this uh this uh, asian market uh when i was in the los angeles area and um i saw yeah, $14,000 a pound. I was like, wow, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, you can get the lab grown for a lot cheaper. <laughs> Probably wild, yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, um, then there is lion's mane, infam infamous for being really incredible for our nervous system. And, um, you know, I've got my mom on, on lion's mane. She started having a little bit of uh, memory loss and things like that. And I was like, mom, we've got to get you on the lion's mane. And it, it seems to have helped quite a bit. Um, and we're, and I, I'm going to go ahead and put this out there. A lot of people say the fruiting bodies only, but I beg to differ because, um, some of the enzymes that are produced in the mycelium are actually what help with the nerve growth, growth factor. Okay. So I always, 
I tend to, whether that's with plants, plant medicine or, um, or, or mushroom medicine, I suggest full spectrum. And there's a lot of science behind some of that. And, and we need more, we need more research. We need more data, but just as an intuitive, um, I'm going to tell, and also reading the science behind it, this is incredibly good. And I do suggest using full spectrum with specifically the lion's mane. Lion's mane is a powerful nootropic. It is put in the category of nootropics. So that means it, it's really good for our cognition, our ability to think, our ability to have long-term memory, short-term memory, all of that. But I just show here in this picture, the similarities of the mycelium versus the cerebellum in the brain. Um, I find it interesting that the cerebellum looks very uh, similar to some mycelium. Um, I, you know, I know that's pseudoscience, but, um, but you know, it's something to look at. Um, uh, what's incredible about lion's mane is that it helps with, uh, injuries, uh, head injuries even. Um, and uh, I mean, I have a cousin who had to have some serious brain surgery and I'm like, get on the lion's mane, you know, uh, is super, I, I, you know, I just feel really strongly about it. But when we're taking these mushrooms and at the same time, putting a lot of intention behind bringing our moods up, because these things if our nervous system's happy, we are going to be a lot happier just in general, okay? Um, and there's a lot that to be said about the lion's mane mushroom. Now, okay, going into mitaki, Graffola frondosa. This is a beautiful, beautiful mushroom. It does not grow in our Colorado area, um, unfortunately, but I work with it a lot. I think it's a delicious food mushroom. Um, it's also uh, called hen of the woods. It is a fertility mushroom, specifically in women, but of course, everyone benefits from it. Um, what it does is it, uh, it helps to balance our, uh, insulin and our insulin in our bodies is what it's like, mo it modulates our, our hormonal production. Okay. Cause if that's all off, like in our blood sugars, all of that, if that's off, then our brain is not producing the right, um, chemicals and, um, or not in right ratios. And so I have found so, so this particular mushroom is really good for fertility. It's really good to help regulate, um, you know, pe the periods in women um, and things like that. Um, so yes, uh, insulin sensitivity. Oh, you're growing on me. Oh, <laughs> uh -huh. so it aids in the filtration and the movement of blood. And that is going to help balance our sex hormones in general. So when our hormones are all ba are balanced, we're going to have more sex drive. We just are. And like I said, sex drive and life force energy are tied together. They go hand in hand. My talkie is, I call it the women's mushroom. That one, and I didn't put any information about Masima mushrooms, the lentius, uh, or Felinus lentius. That one I, mi I mix my Taki and Masima for women specifically to help balance uh, hormones. Um, it, it helps with fatigue, low libido, bloating, cramps, all of that. So specifically in women, my Taki, take the my Taki. Um, I'm telling you, it helps tremendously. It's a beautiful mushroom. And it, it like I said, it's an incredibly delicious edible. So it's kind of nice when you can get your, your medicine from your food. And then corn smut. Oh, huelacoche. That's fun just to say, you know. Uh, I actually have not eaten this mushroom. And I really, I have inoculated uh, corn. I grew a bunch of green dense corn and we inoculated it. And we had some of it uh, actually um, sprout out, but only a few actually did. So we just kept it to, uh, to show as a presentation. But I am I'm very willing, open, and uh, ready to, 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 to try this. I, I want some tacos, you know. But the thing is, is that it is considered an aphrodisiac in Mexico. And it's probably because it's really good for us. It's interesting because that particular mushroom or fungus, not really a mushroom, it's a fungus that attacks the ears of corn. It's a parasite, supposedly. But um, corn in itself is not very nutritious. It really isn't. But then when it when it has this fungus attack it, it is suddenly full of nutrients. And so I find that highly interesting. I'm like, okay, I, I need some. It looks really weird, but I, I, I think I might need, need some in my life. Yeah, the Aztecs used it uh, as, as, a, you know, as a form of um, 
potency, producing potency, as well as, you know, Mexico, Central America, all of that area. Hilacoche, yes. Smutty maize cobs, oh gosh. <laughs> so back to the heart and the brain connection. This is a really potent topic for me. And it's one that I'm diving into deeper. Um, the heart is intelligent. It, it ha actually holds memories. Like if you've been hurt, you will, you will put protection over, over your heart. Um, but this particular, yeah, if you want to know more about this particular subject, I highly suggest the book Science of the Heart. And it talks about the mathematics of the heart and the way that it beats. And it's just super, super interesting. And um, about five years ago, I started um, putting this together because I'm a very, I'm very intuitive. You know, I don't want to turn anybody off by saying that, but I am a little, but I, um, I gain insight in my dreams a lot of times. And then when I go and research and read about things, I'm like, oh, I, I just, I, I was just tapping into it or something like that, but, but this particular topic is very important to me. How do we connect our brains, all of the brains? And, and this is the heart and brain connection, but I'm talking about the gut as well. It, it really is all tied in together. And um, I came across an author by the name of Tom Lane. He wrote the book, let's see. So this was, he, he, he actually, um, I found him. And he studied the, not the, necessarily the Aztecs, but the Toltecs, which was a kind of like a, they were an offset from, from uh, the Aztecs. And what were their rituals? How did they use psilocybin mushrooms in their ceremonies? And so I, he sent me his book. I was really, I'm really grateful. And a lot of really good information. I think he lived down there for about uh, 20 years and studied this. So um, I, I highly suggest his book, Sacred Mushroom Rituals, uh, The Search of the Blood of Quetzalcoatl, but uh, <laughs> it kind of sounds like a creepy name, but no, really good book, very informative as to the rituals and, uh, and the usages of psilocybin mushrooms during, during those ancient times, and they were all about the heart, okay? This is like the codex, and um, Tom sent me this picture, and uh, I got to meet up with him last spring down at the Georgia Mushroom Festival. And he was showing me the codec, like he was showing me pictures of the codec and he was explaining to me what he had actually, I, I guess he's, he's one of the people who have helped to um, kind of figure out what the codec is actually saying. <laughs> but he talks about, um, you know, the psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, they used specifically uh, psil uh, psilocybe zapatocorum. Uh, it's also refer referred to as the crown of thorns mushroom. It's very high in psilocin and psilocybin, <clears throat> more so than say a psilocybe cubensis. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about how they utilize these mushrooms uh, real quick. Like they, uh, they would eat it, they wouldn't swallow the mushroom, they wouldn't eat it, but they would take a fresh psilocybe zapatocorum and they would cover it with honey and they used the honey from uh, the honey wasp. So it wasn't a bee, there's an actual wasp that, that makes honey and they cover the, the mushroom in this honey and they would sing to it, you know, set their intention. And then they would put it in their mouth and chew on it and you chew and chew and chew and chew. And what happens is, is that juice starts to absorb through the mucous membranes in your mouth. And what happens is, yes, it's very, very close to this brain, but it goes down the, the vagus nerve and it goes straight to the heart. Okay. So what they did in order to open the heart, I, I guess I sh I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. What they would do is they would fast for several days preceding this, this ritual. They would fast and then they would drink a very strong cacao drink. Cacao um, is the precursor to chocolate. Um, and it is an MOA, it's an MOA uh, inhibitor. So that, so when you take chocolate right before you have something like psilocybin or something that floods your brain with serotonin, it actually increases the potency. You're gonna have more serotonin and, and, that, and the psilocybin seems to be stronger when you associate it with chocolate. Now they would drink a very strong cacao drink and then they would, um, you know, they would sing to the mushroom and chew on it, chew on it. And then it goes down the vagus nerve to the heart. Now, the thing about cacao is it is thought to be a heart opener. And in the, in the Toltec tradition, they believe that the gods 
only allow humans to use cacao or have cacao plants growing on the planet when we need to open our hearts. And so that the gods blessed us with this particular plant in order to open our hearts. And I, you know, I can agree with that. We need to, op- everyone needs to open their hearts a little bit more. And why not? You know, um, I have not tried this particular um, ritual, you know, with the, um, with the honey wasp and all of that, but I have taken in taken cacao right before in taking my psilocybin. And it, it really does. It, it's, it's almost like this fuzzy feeling here. It's more, you know, it, it brings it away from here into here. And so I, I find that very fascinating. <clears throat> so psilocybin, okay, there are different dosage levels. And I wanted to just kind of, you know, you can find a lot of this information online, but I wanted to go ahead and just kind of put it out there. There's a microdose, which is about a half a gram to a gram of the dried powder or the dried mushroom. And you can uh, weigh that up. And this is going to enhance your mood might cause mild euphoria, but you're still, you may not even feel it at this level. You know, some people don't even feel it at that level. I know I do at a, at a gram, I can, I can feel it. But, um, so that's like a micro. Now a euphoric or aphrodisiac dose, you're gonna take about 1.75 grams to about two grams. And you're gonna feel it, but it's not gonna be overwhelming. You're just gonna feel like, euphoric, like very euphoric, very mm, just kind of melty. And uh, you might have some perceptual distortions, but not a whole lot. And that is the amount that I suggest taking if you're taking it with the intention of connecting with a partner or with a group of people, you know, taking it in these lower dosages, not, not, I mean, yes, you can take a microdose and, and, and it'll work just fine. But just taking that little bit more where you you feel it, but you're not totally blasted, you know? There's a high dose and a heroic dose, okay? And you can do that, but I find that if I take a lot of mushrooms, I kind of want to just go and be by myself. I want to cozy up. I want to feel comfy. I want to get in my own space or, you know, I mean, you can cuddle too, you know, I mean, that's all beautiful. Okay. But it doesn't allow for you to be present with another person. So what I suggest is taking this euphoric dose at two grams or less so that you are able to practice some of these you know, practice exercises with your partner. Um, <clears throat> I'm personally, I'm studying to be a, um, not necessarily a relationship coach, but like an intimacy coach, helping people to be able to open up and be intimate. And intimacy doesn't mean sex necessarily. Being intimate with your partner, being open, you know, uh, doing an exercise like staring into each other's eyes for like three minutes. Sounds like a really short amount of time. But when you stare into someone's eyes, even if it's a stranger, it does something. It is very powerful. And um, I highly suggest it. Um, Also practicing um, touch, like touching each other's hands, touching each other, you know, just not necessarily, like I said, sexual, but like being able to be present with someone and share that intimacy, even with no words spoken, can be super powerful and really connecting. It allows for blockages. Like we have, we can have energetic blockages and being able to work through those blockages with another person can really strengthen a bond between two people. And um, yes, you can do these heroic doses with another person, but you may not be able to be completely present with them. And you might be able to, you know, I mean, that's totally individual, totally individual. But I do see some of these mushrooms as portals or, uh, or they allow us to be open, especially in our heart energy with another person. And like I said, it doesn't have to be a lover. It doesn't have to be a romantic partner. It can be anyone. And, um, and it can be yourself because really some of these mushrooms, like when, when our nervous system is fully functioning and we're able to drop into these spaces that maybe have been closed off, it really allows us to see how interconnected we are with our environment, with our earth, with, you know, within ourselves, it's all connected. And that's what you hear from other people over and over again. You know, the feedback is that, yeah, I, 
I see how connected we are, all are, but, but imagine doing that with the intention of truly connecting with another person. And so that's where I, I see that this is a really strong tool in helping us to work through some, uh, maybe these interpersonal situations that, um, you know, that, that otherwise might be a little bit more difficult. So now I'm gonna kind of um, phase into another uh, mushroom topic, the Amanita muscaria. Now this particular mushroom is considered a little bit taboo. You know, people, it, it gets a bad rap. It gets a bad rap. I'll just say that. But I've been working with this mushroom for seven, eight years now, eight years. Um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful, I believe it's a very beautiful aphrodisiac. And I'm going to tell you why. Okay. It's incredible for our nervous system. Number one, it's very relaxing to the nervous system, helps with uh, all sorts of anxiety. It helps with depression. It helps to bring our awareness to our dreams. It's a dream mushroom. It's a very lucid mushroom. It's completely different, completely different than psilocybin-based mushrooms. Um, it's also referred to as the fly agaric. This is our iconic mushroom that we see in fairy tales, uh, in children's novels, um, but it's been used for time immemorial by particular cultures. Now it gets a bad rap because, well, it has toxins in it that can make us sick. And that's why it's very, very important to know what you're doing or know the exact mushroom that you're working with. Now, there are different varieties of Amanita muscarias that grow all over the world. Um, our particular one that grows in the Rocky Mountains here is uh, Amanita muscaria flavivovata. Flavio, <laughs> and that one has been found to be higher in ibotenic acid and muscimol. And I find that very interesting. And um, and I could tell you a story about that, but um, I was out in the woods here. So, um, so in Siberia, there's a in Siberia there is a um, is the lore around uh, the flying reindeer and reindeer eating Amanita muscaria. Well, many mammals consume Amanita muscaria, and I'm going to tell you, I was uh, <laughs> above ten thousand feet. In, um, in Colorado, up above Durango. And I, I was with my kids and we're, we're gathering King Bolites. We're, uh, you know, we're out there gathering some Amanita muscaria. And I'm noticing that some of these Amanita muscaria have these giant bite marks taken out of them. And I'm like, oh, so the deer, you know, obviously the deer here and you can see like little teeth marks from mice and things like that. And it's super cute. But we saw two huge male moose. So I said, I'm gonna need a muscaria. <laughs> but um, holy smokes, there's a freaking moose. He's a moose. We're not gonna go up there. We're gonna leave them alone. They're the ones that are eating the freaking Amanita muscaria, dude. The moose. <laughs> the moose are the ones that are eating the Amanita muscaria. I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> I found it very intriguing and supposedly they're highly aggressive animals. They, they were definitely not uh, scared of us. They were just, they're like, looked at us like, okay, whatever humans, but Amanita muscaria is so beautiful. And when I find it, I, I just, I, I think they look like little gems out there. <clears throat> um, this last season was just absolutely insanely beautiful for, um, for, for, Amanita muscaria and, and for our portini. Oh, that's just so silly. <laughs> but yeah, they're just so beautiful. And when you find them, they just, it's just so exciting. And um, here's a little video here. Some glad morning when this life is over. I'll away to a home that's a celestial show. Right. So yes, Amanita muscaria. <clears throat> I'm going to go into what the constituents are in uh, Amanita muscaria. Um, the thing is, is that ibotenic acid, so this, is, so the muscimol is really what is the psychoactive and what is the medicine basically. And uh, there's been more and more research done on this. Even in the last two years, there's been some more uh, research or, you know, scientific data that's kind of come to the surface. And um, it is, 
so, so the muscimol is incredible for any type of nervous condition and it's been used to treat epilepsy, epileptic seizures. What it does, so what the, what the muscimol does is it binds to the GABA receptors. Um, so that allows for a smoother transference of electrical pulses in the nervous system. What happens when you're having a left ep epileptic seizure is basically there's a misfiring happening. So like there it's, it's, and it causes you to go into a seizure. So this has been shown to be incredibly good for specifically epilepsy, but um, anything nervous related. And I, you know, Parkinson's, now there's been like in the last couple of years, there's uh, research that are, that's showing Parkinson's, I've been like saying Parkinson's disease, but like it helps calm, calm that nervousness, um, even anxiety. But they're showing that even depression in itself can be related back to, Degenerate, degenerative or de degeneration of our nervous tissues. So, um, but muscimol, okay, the, it's, these are older slides. I've got some newer slides here too, but there is a, there is a certain level of toxicity in Amanita muscaria that, uh, that kind of scares people off because if you were to eat it raw or, or you have to prepare it properly. If you were to eat it, just eat it raw. It's probably going to make you nauseated. It's probably, it's going to cause you to sweat, salivate. You're going to have to urinate. It's just, uh, it, it kind of causes you to flush out toxins, quite frankly. So even though it's taxing your liver, you're also like, you're excreting a lot. Okay. But what I, suggest is not doing that because that's painful. You know, why put ourselves through unnecessary? I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not into the pain part of it. So ibotenic acid is what causes the uncomfortable feelings. There, ha there really hasn't been any deaths associated with Amanita muscaria. There are Amanita varieties, um, like the death cap, uh, the destroying angel. Like uh, there's some, there's some really, scary mushrooms out there that will kill you dead. And so that's why it's super important to know what, what the heck you're dealing with, what you're working with. But when you're dealing with an Amanita muscaria, you're pretty safe. You're not, if you, especially if you prepare it properly. Okay. So what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to convert the ibotenic acid into more muscimol. So it has muscimol, ibotenic acid, and muscarine in it. Now we know that muscarine in a gas form is, um, is toxic for us. You know, you don't want to breathe that in. But when it's in these trace amounts, it's not really going to cause a lot of damage. But what you do is you evaporate it out. And, and when it reaches heat, the, the heat uh, status of 110 degrees Fahrenheit, the muscarine is gone. So you're getting rid of the muscarine, period. And then what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to convert your ibotenic acid into muscimol. And um, this is how you do it. So the first the first step is separating the cap from your stock, from the stamen. You don't want to use this, the stock. You're only using your cap and you dry it. I like to put it on a dryer or a dehydrator at you know low levels of heat, but <clears throat> you dry it till it's cracker dry. I mean, dry. That's your first step. Now I call it decarboxylation because we know with like cannabis, you decarboxylate it, but there's another term for it, but you're basically doing that. You're decarboxylating the ibotenic or ibotenic acid into muscimol. That's your first step. Then what you're going to do is you weigh it out depending on how, you know, how much you're wanting. And I'll go over the, the ratios here in just a second, but um, you're wanting to weigh out your, your Amanita muscaria. And then you're going to do a water extract because the muscimol is water soluble. And so when you, when you do, when you do the water extract, your tea is what you intake, or if you're making it into a tincture, which I, I make uh, microdose tinctures, um, that you're not going to feel the sick, the sickening, um, effects. Hey, Rain, we, uh, we need to wrap up. We're, we're at the end of our time. So if you want to allow just a few moments for questions, I can, uh, sure. ask if you take questions around the room. Sure. Let's see if there's anything else that I think is important. But yes, um, you know, a lot of these mushrooms are incredible. Um, I have some stacks here. And if you want to talk to me personally, I can email you these stacks, but like um, stacking different types of mushrooms with, um, with each other and with um, other substances. Like I'm very much fond of cayenne pepper because it brings things to your bloodstream really quickly. 
So when you're mixing like say psilocybin and cordyceps and lion's mane with your cayenne pepper, it's, uh, it's, it's quite potent. Um, I do have- See if we have uh, If you wanna put up your contact details on the screen and then we'll take questions around the room. I love that idea. All right, I think we're at the end here, but thank you so much for listening to my, um, my talk about this. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Do you have any questions for Rain? Just oh, just the contact info. Yeah. If so you want to put it up there. Sure. Yeah. So um, let's see if I can find it. But uh, Colorado Mushroom Company is my company. So Colorado Mushroom Company at Gmail is a good way to email me. Um, you can also Google search my name, Rain Grant, and I come up under several different uh, different things. I, I, I do a lot of uh, activities. Um, in the public domain, we'll just say. Um, and so you can contact me by looking up my name, R-A-Y-N-E Grant or uh, Colorado Mushroom Company. And that's a pretty easy way to find me. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and then my, yeah, my email address, Colorado Mushroom Company at Gmail. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much, Rain. Thank you.